Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. You, if you are a believer, have great potential. But that potential will only be realized when you commit to the program of God. You submit to His will. And then God will use you and you will fulfill that great potential. But the question is this. Do you have a desire for the things of God? I say so frequently that the greatest problem with believers today is this. We have been taught a lie. That God's in my life, He stands in my corner, and He's there to help me achieve my dreams, my so-called destiny, what I believe is right. That's not biblical. That will not cause you to fulfill the purposes of God. The scripture that we're going to begin to study today is a dynamic passage. It has great implications. It did 2,000 years ago, and it has all the way up until the end of this age and the establishment of the kingdom of God. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to chapter 10. For the most part, what we're going to be studying is in chapter 10. But before getting there, I want to review the last two verses of chapter 9. And this is why I speak of this great potential. In chapter 9, we read, beginning in verse 37, Then he speaks to his disciples, obviously Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. He speaks to his disciples, and notice what he says. The harvest is much. Now, of course, there's many translations which translate this word as plentiful, and that's fine, but literally, it's a word for much or great in number. But there's a problem. But the labors are few. And I believe he's speaking to you and me in this passage as well. Because again, even though there was a historical fulfillment of this, it has an end time ramification, an end time implication to it. So the laborers are few. Therefore, what should we do? Well, he writes, Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest, Thus he shall cast forth labors into his harvest. Now, notice, it's not send forth, but cast forth. I wanted to translate it literally. And this casting forth means him empowering, him causing, him bringing about. So pray that he would do just that and that you and I would play a role in this. Now look at chapter 10. In chapter 10, we find these words, and calling before him his 12 disciples. So once more, Yeshua is speaking, and there's an emphasis on not just disciples, but his 12 disciples. And we know that the number 12 is very important. It relates to Israel. And we learn from this. We have to derive this from the text. That in a preferable manner, Yeshua's 12 disciples were sent to the lost sheep of Israel. We'll see this. Because Israel needs to get right spiritually for God's purposes, His plans to be fulfilled. Don't believe the false teaching 
that God is finished with Israel, that he's replaced Israel. You know who knows all too well that God's plans revolve around Israel for his kingdom establishment? The enemy, Satan. And that's why he is anti-Semitic. That's why he has so often and frequently throughout history moved to destroy the Jewish people. That's why the world is against the establishment of the nation of Israel. And Jewish people dwelling in their homeland, in Judea and Samaria. Now, I live in Israel. I live in Ashdod, which is along the Mediterranean coast. One of the five cities that God said that he was going to give to the Jewish people from the Philistines in my city. No more Philistines, but a quarter of a million Jewish people. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. But when we speak about the heartland of Israel, we're talking about Judea and Samaria. And that's where the world wants to create a Palestinian state. This is in conflict with the purposes, the plans, the prophetic truth of God. So don't make an error. Realize those 12 disciples, they are related, and we'll see this in a very clear way, to the people, the land of Israel. So he speaks to his 12 disciples. And notice what takes place. Calling them to him, he gave to them, notice this next word, authority. Now, this word, exousia, I've mentioned it before. And we really need two English words to, to grasp the meaning. And these two English words are the word power and the word authority. And here's the implication. It is only when you submit to this authority that you will be given power to accomplish the purpose. Authority comes with a purpose. You submit to the purpose, you receive power to accomplish that purpose. That's what he's doing here. So calling the 12 before him, he gave to them authority and power over what? Over unclean spirits, so that they cast them out and, notice what else, and to heal every disease and every sickness. Now, that description is very significant. Have we ever seen a time in history where there's no, in this word, any demonic activity and no sickness nor disease? We have not. But we have been called to battle that. But this term, realize, it is a kingdom description. We're supposed to do kingdom work. And the way it's written foreshadows a kingdom experience. And what I mean by that is this. In the kingdom of God, there's not going to be any demonic activity. There will not be any sickness or disease of any type. And that is what we're supposed to bring into this world. We have a great potential. But the question is, are we going to fulfill that potential? And here, God's going to tell us how we do just that. Look now to verse, verse 2. The emphasis on these 12 disciples, and therefore we read, the names which were to the 12, and here it is, apostles. There's a switch these 12 that, that he sent forth, and the sending forth is where we get the word apostles. They, the first one, was called Shimon, or Simon, also called Peter. So Simon Peter. And his brother Andrew, and Yaakov of Zebulon, and also John, his brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, Yaakov of Alphaeus, and Lebaios, the one called Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite. And this probably means that, that Shimon or Simon was from that land of Canaan in a, a unique way, not from Jerusalem specifically, but, but an area where the Canaanites inhabited. And then finally we see Judas, or Yehuda in Hebrew, 
Iscariot, the one who would betray him. These 12 Yeshua sent, and not only did he send, but see this next phrase, and commanded them. Now realize, when there is a sending forth, when there is given an mission, a call, the first thing that we can expect, and this is consistent throughout the scripture, is that there's going to be commandments given. You cannot fulfill the call unless you understand and faithfully carry out the commandments that are related to that call. And the commandments here are most informing. Look now to the next scripture, the second part of verse 5. Yeshua commanding them, saying, into the way of the nations. This is the word for roads. So don't travel the way of the nations. Don't enter in. Don't go that way. And also into the city of the Samaritans. Do not enter. So two things. Don't travel the way the Gentiles go and don't go into the cities of the Samaritans. Now, some would say don't leave Israel and don't minister to, at this time, the Samaritans. The Samaritans were individuals that had turned away from scriptural authority, turned away from the full counsel of God, and embraced a pagan uh, uh, tradition, mixing it with some of the things of Judaism, but, but not all. They were a confused people that had rejected the authority of Jerusalem. And because of that, we see here, don't go the roads of the nations, don't go into the cities of the Samaritans, but rather, he says, in the first word here, is the word day in contrast to that. He's got something different. In contrast to that, he says, rather go to, and here it is, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it's very important that we hear this. And as we'll see, especially next week and the weeks to come, as we move forward in chapter, chapter 10, we're going to see hints, clues within the text, what the theologians would call hermeneutical aids. And these hints and clues point to the last days, the end times. And what should the reader take away from the text? That God is going to work mightily in Israel with the Jewish people in the last days. And this is foundational for the king to be established. Don't believe the lie of many. That God has replaced Israel, that he has substituted Israel that there's no longer a relevance to that land, the land of Israel, or the Jewish people in a unique way. That is false teaching. The prophets don't agree with such a, a, a theology. No, God is going to keep covenant. Now, there's not a way different for a Jewish people to enter into the kingdom than a Gentile. It's the gospel. The gospel for humanity. There's only one. Any other teaching about the kingdom is a false gospel that's really not good news, and that's what the word gospel means. But Israel's going to play a foundational role in the establishment of the kingdom, and this is going to be seen as we move forward in chapter 10. But look here now at our text. He says, Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, you proclaim, saying that the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, what is this telling us? It's telling the reader that there's a kingdom. It exists in the heaven. And that kingdom that resides in the heavens is coming to earth. That's why Messiah is returning. And we're going to see in the weeks to come, in this 10th chapter, there's going to be an emphasis on the return of Messiah. What he's going to do when he comes the second time for the purpose of establishing the kingdom of God. 
And we're going to learn as well other clues from the text that helps us get ready for those last days. So he says, as you go, proclaim, saying the kingdom of heaven is near. And then in verse 8, we see four things, uniquely four. Why four? Well, he's speaking, this message is to the lost sheep of Israel, but it has implications for all the world. Realize, Israel is a vessel of God, created supernaturally for a purpose, and that purpose is to bless the nation, to bring in God's truth, His power, His authority into this world so that all, potentially, all the families of the earth can be blessed. Now, will all the families? No. But God has provided atonement, redemption for all of them. But to access that, to receive that, one has to act in faith. And what faith are we talking about? Receiving the gospel. Acknowledging one's sinfulness and believing in what Messiah did upon that cross, the shedding of blood, that he died on that cross but rose from the dead on the third day, showing victory. That's the message for humanity, Jew and Gentile alike, for salvation. And if you reject that, well, you'll grow to see what the outcome of that is at the end of our study. Look at verse 8. Four things he says to do. He says, sick ones, heal. Lepers, clean. Dead, rise. And those who are demonically possessed, demons cast out. Four things. Hear them again. Sick ones, heal. Lepers, cleanse. Dead ones, rise up. And demons cast out. Why four? Four is a global number. It reflects to the world. And these things God wants to bring into the world. And Israel is a tool to do just that. Now look at verse, verse 9. He says, freely you have received, freely give. It's not about what we receive. We've received salvation. That's everything. We received our names written in the Lamb's book of life. That assures our presence forever in the kingdom of God. So freely we have received. He's paid the price. He's enabled that to be my eternal reality. Freely I've received. Give this same message free. Do the work of the kingdom freely. This is what he instructs this disciples. And he says, do not, another commandment, do not acquire gold nor silver nor copper into your, your belt. This would be one's melty, melt money belt, the purse that contains money. He says, as you serve, don't, don't do this as profiteering. This is not about an earthly prosperity. This is a false teaching. Read what he says very clearly. Do not, a command, acquire gold and silver and copper into your belts, nor for the way a bag. Don't take a bag full of things to either bring them with you because he says, keep reading, nor bring two tunics, two garments, nor sandals in the plural nor steps. Why? Why don't we have to bring these things? Well, remember, when Israel was in the wilderness, God was leading them. And when God leads, what did, did they have? He says, only one garment did they have, but it didn't wear out. Their shoes did not wear out. Their feet did not swell. Things supernaturally were preserved. There was an enduring there was not the effects of wear and tear. Why? They were under the Lord's leadership. The whole purpose that God brought Israel into the wilderness is to teach them to trust Him. 
And this is what he's telling the disciples. You want to have the outcome of my presence with you, follow these commands. Trust me. It is not about an earthly prosperity, but a kingdom faithfulness here in this age, and you'll reap in the age to come. So these things don't take, why? Look at the second half of verse, verse 10. For worthy is the labor of his trophis. Trophis is a daily ration. It's food. Some would say meat. That's fine. But it's not a gourmet meal. It is not food in abundance. It means the food necessary to sustain someone for a day. And God is faithful to provide that. He says, for worthy is the labor of his daily portion. Verse, verse 11. Into a city or village you shall enter. And seek, inquire who in it is worthy, and there remain until you go out. Now, this is a simple practice. What's the purpose? Stay in that same home until you leave. If it's worthy, it is going to be taught. You're going to have it influence your testimony, your ways, so that when you go forth, that house, the leadership, the father, he is going to be able to take over this work to be that influence for the kingdom of God there after they depart and go into another city. So he gives instruction, remain in that house. And something else he says concerning that, we read in, in verse, verse 12, and upon entering into the house, greet it, meaning inquire, say shalom, this has... The word here for greet it has to do with not just a greeting, but we say in Hebrew, drashat shalom, meaning seeking the will of God. That's what the greeting in a biblical sense was. Are you interested in the will of God? And if they receive you, notice what it says. Let your greeting be upon it, and if that house is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is not worthy, your peace will return unto you. This peace, it's a blessing. So bless this house. But if this house isn't worthy, meaning this, if it's not interested in the things of God, what then? Well, notice what the scripture says as we continue on. Verse, verse 13, 14. And if they do not receive you, nor your words. What is this about? Receiving us means they have to receive the words. You can't receive the person without receiving his proclamation. These disciples sent by Messiah. So they have to believe these words. If not, what does he say? Keep reading. As you go forth from that house and from that city, shake the dust from your feet. It's a testimony. If they don't receive the words, if they're not interested in the truth of God, what are we called to do? He says, go forth from that house. Go forth from that city and shake the dust from it. It's a testimony. It's a testimony that, that their future is, is upon their own shoulders because they rejected the faithfulness of God, sending labors to them with truth and with a kingdom offering. Remember, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and also cast out demons. But here's how we're going to end today. Notice the conclusion of our passage. Look to now verse 15. We read, Truly I say to you that it will be more tolerable. The word here has to do with ease. It will be lighter, meaning the punishment will be lighter, that burden. It will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Amorah, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. More tolerable for these wicked places than it says 
for that city when? In the day of judgment. I want to underscore that. See, there's a problem today, and it's this. Too many Bible teachers are setting aside the reality, the fact that there's a day of judgment coming. And that day of judgment happens before the establishment of the kingdom. And we need, our responsibility is to get people ready for that. And that's why it's so important that we teach them that this is a reality. Judgment is coming. Now, there's popular Bible teachers, and they'll say things such as, well, I just feel that, that this message of judgment is not for me to, to share. God has entrusted it to everyone who says, I am teaching the word of God. You can't just say, there's things I'm going to share and things I'm not going to share. No, we need to give people all the truth. And a, a portion of the truth distorts the truth. All the word of God. Messiah says to them, it will be more tolerable for those people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, those who committed an abomination, those who were violent, selfish people that did what was right in their own eyes. He says it will be more tolerable for them. Why? Because these people, they had an opportunity to hear the gospel, to, to receive forgiveness of their sins. And because the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they had not that opportunity. Therefore, what happens? Their eternal judgment will be less. Now, it's still going to be eternal condemnation, but it's going to be less than those of these places in Judea and Samaria in the land, those lost sheep of Israel that were given the gospel but rejected it. Serious words. We need to know that the message of this book is serious. And those who reject it will eternally regret this worst error that they've ever made. So we tell the truth. There is a kingdom, but there's also judgment. And it's only through the grace of God that brings you through that day of judgment that causes you to be removed from it and taken into the kingdom of God. This is the good news. And I'll close with that until next week. May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.